Hello and welcome back to the studio. Today it is cold outside and it is five o'clock so it is 4 59. I'm not joking. I'm serious about my five o'clock. It's five o'clock. I'm gonna pour myself a glass of either Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc. I can't remember what's in the fridge and I'm going to have a little happy hour downtime painting session um, in my handmade watercolor book from my friend. I broke this book open and did my first painting in it in another YouTube video if that interests you. And since then I've only made one more painting in it, which is sad. I need to make more. So I hope you will join me. So grab yourself a glass of wine or a cozy drink and let's paint together. So to get started here, I've pulled out a Prismacolor Color Ace colored pencil in a purple color and I'm starting to sketch out this figure here. I put a couple points down, a little couple dots to kind of give myself the scale first of what the chair was going to, um, how far it would extend down and up on the little sketchbook page. And this is an enormous chair, so I was a bit <laughs> confused, at it by for, confused about it at first. Um, and you can see I'm just starting with a really light touch and then once I figure out a line I'll I'll give a bit more pressure to it. Um, this by no means uh, is a successful sketch. It didn't turn out exactly how I liked. The paper is um, probably 100% cotton. It's very soft and so it wasn't actually erasing very well. I pulled out that white uh, plastic eraser on the end of that I had added to the end of that yellow pencil there. To try to kind of clean up my mess a little bit um, and I'm drawing hands here I'm I don't I'm not very practiced at drawing hands I need to uh, need to work on that but I kind of just break the different parts of the hand into pieces um, rather than think of all the fingers individually I think of them as you can see little chunks there like back of hand and then hand to the second knuckle like just kind of segmenting the hand into different um, areas and I try several times I'm not very happy with it and I'm also not sure at this point um, how much detail I'm going to add like will I go over this with pen later or am I going to just let the hands be a bit more um, a bit less defined so not knowing that yet, not knowing the style that I was going to complete the drawing with has kind of made me a bit more finicky with the hands here than I needed to be. Probably should just leave it like that. I mean, that's, you get that they're hands. It doesn't look too, too bad. Um, but something that, I mean, I'm just trying to be a bit transparent about my process and show that, you know, if you were, if you're at a practice with something for a while, you're not going to be happy with it. You can, as an artist, you identify what isn't working. You don't always, you're not always necessarily able to fix it just because you know it's wrong, right? Um, and with this one, I'm just reminding myself I should probably stay loose and get the gist down instead of being so particular and finicky about it. Really like the shape of the, the chair arm there. Have a lot of fun with that. But you can see I've switched to just an HB pencil, a mechanical pencil. Um, and the lines that it left were a bit more uh, pronounced than with the colored pencil. But based on the type of paper, how soft it is, it's a really good quality watercolor paper. I just felt like I needed to um, have a bit more control over the drawing medium 
And so that's why I pulled out the pencil. And I'm just adding the chair in here and segmenting as I did in the arms. You can see I did sort of segments and that's kind of identifying where I want my lights to stay and where like that right there is where I want the light to hit at the top of the chair. And it's important to do that with watercolor if you want to maintain the white of the page. You could do have to kind of outline or sketch very lightly where your highlights will be. There's a, just a window in the background. The uh, perspective of the background is a complete wreck in this uh, in this sketch, and it's okay. I um, I'm just gonna let it be what it is. It's a little easy sketch with a glass of wine at the end of a day. And it's not going to be perfect and it's not going to show off my um, my skills but we are hoping it will be passable there she is let's begin in with the watercolor shall we i am going to be using my size 4 scepter gold 2 brush it's uh, a really nice round brush and kind of a good size for this tiny little thin sketchbook. At this point I'm trying to erase some of my lines, lighten them a bit, but what I really needed to use and was too lazy to get up and go get was one of those gummy erasers, those gray kneaded erasers. Had I just gotten out of my seat and gone and grabbed one of those, I could press it down all over this drawing and it wouldn't affect the lines and it wouldn't hurt the paper. Right? I'm doing a very light um, rubbing there, so it, it isn't damaging too bad, but I think that a gummy or um, kneadable eraser would have been best to just sort of press on top here and lighten everything um, where I could still see the drawing and paint from it successfully. I just made a poor choice and laziness won over, <laughs> so I didn't get up and go hunting for my kneaded eraser. Oops. It's a great tool though, and if you work in watercolor, you absolutely must have one. It is so helpful to lighten your sketches without actually getting rid of them. I'm just gonna start in with the arms here. The light, the overall light in this scene is quite warm. Um, I mean, from the window there, it is. it looks pretty cold, right? There's a little bit of, of a blue tint in that highlight but then from the rest of the room it's a sort of yellowy warm glow like you might see from a uh, a lamp inside your house or library i have not found a chair this large at my library <laughs> but if i did i'd probably be filming a little video of me sitting in it and sketching from the chair i mean that chair is epic So I'm mixing quite warm skin tones here. And a little note on color, it's okay to stray, right? The, the goal isn't always to find exactly the color that you see and represent that, but rather to use the colors on hand, the ones that you have in your palette, and make a good painting within the range of, of the palette that you own. So that means um, it's still working to achieve the right values, the lights and darknesses. I'm just lifting some of that off there because it was a bit of a heavy, had a bit of a heavy hand there with laying that on. So I lightened it just by pressing my paper towel on top of it. But yeah, um, if you don't have certain colors, you know, there's, you might be limited in, in the range that you can achieve, the hues, but you can still make the what you do have, sorry, I'm not being very articulate here. You can still make what you do have into the full range of light to dark, and you can still build the same, build similar relationships between colors, even if yours are a bit different. I hope that makes sense. For example, I have a great example actually, um, I once sat down and I really wanted to paint this uh, trio, this portrait or you know, three, a painting of three people 
and I actually didn't have any white on me. And this was in oil paint, I want to say, and I didn't have any white. I thought to myself, well, too bad, can't can't make the painting. But I really wanted to, and I didn't live somewhere with an art store, and so I used what I had. I decided my lightest, uh, chroma- my paint with the lightest chromatic value, the lightest light to dark, um, was my yellow. And so I just used that as if it was white. And so I made the full range of portraits and used the full fullest range of value I could achieve. And they turned out well. I mean, there's a severe yellow glow over the whole thing, but it was, it was a successful experiment for sure. I learned a lot. So don't be limited by thinking, oh, I don't have a a peachy color for skin or I don't have a black. You don't need black. You can mix dark values like ultramarine blue with burnt umber and you can get a dark value. And it's not going to maybe look like the subject you're looking at, but I spent years and years and years never owning a a black or never using black paint in my oil paintings. I just used hues with darker chromatic value to darken things and create the relationships I needed. So just use what you have. And I feel like I should talk about letting go right now as I paint this sadly um, inaccurate background. (laughs) Um, It's just a little rough perspective wise, but I wasn't, you know, I didn't draft it with um, linear perspective in mind. I didn't use any vanishing points or anything like that. I just kind of eyeballed it and you get what you get when you're just kind of eyeballing it and not thinking uh, too analytically. I like that kind of painting and sketching though, when you're just seeing what you can do with your mind turned off, you know, you're not too highly focused. You're just kind of plopping things down, enjoying the process, um, relaxing. And it hurts sometimes to look at afterwards. You're like, oh, I did this wrong or I did that wrong, but that's really not why I sat down to paint today. There's a lot of different reasons to sit down and make a painting, right? And sometimes it's just the habit, like I'm just sitting down to relax right now. And to be honest, when you're really highly focused making art, it can be really uh, energetically draining. It can be um, can be more than what you have to give at that point in time. So I'm going to choose to be kind to myself today and not put that pressure on myself that every time I put brush to paper, I'm making a masterpiece or even something that I like, right? Because I like, I love the process of sitting down to paint. And that would be totally ruined if I was sitting down to get an end result because I do not love the end result of everything I make. Hardly, hardly, hardly. And I probably wouldn't love the end result of what I make half as often if I always sat down with that pressure on my shoulders. So I'm just here to enjoy this today. I hope you are giving yourself plenty of time in your life to make art for pure enjoyment as well. Today I'm using my Schmincke watercolor set. Um, You can probably see that on the pan over there. It was 12 colors and I've added a couple more to it, like that peach color that I was using on the skin. That is just one that I've added. It didn't come with the Schmincke set. Um, I do this a lot. You start with a set and then just sort of add a couple of um, extra colors to sort of broaden your ability with that one set. And the set I'm not using top right, that is a little Christmas tin and inside is the Decadent Pie set from from Prima, Wa- Prima Marketing. Prima Marketing. And um, I'm not using that today, but I thought some of you might still be curious because it's cute. 
And the name of the peachy color uh, that I did add to the set is Naples Yellow Red. So I love Naples Yellow, and this one has more of a, a red sway to it. What I'm doing with this little size four brush is kind of sketching with the paint. Um, I'm putting in some darks there and working wet on dry, right? My paper there is dry. But then I start adding other colors in next to whatever I just painted and it sort of bleeds together and creates an overall quite a soft look, a soft effect. I had a lot of trouble mixing this sort of burgundy color of the leather chair. Um, I went back and forth thinking it was way too purple most of the time. And I kept digging around in my set before I found the right red. And that's the red I needed right there. So now all my troubles are over because I finally, there's what, one, two, three, four, like five different types or sways of, of red there. One of them's more purple, but I just couldn't find the one I needed. Um, and I finally did. I needed a much warmer yellowish red to make that burgundy brown um, instead of the purple, purple heavy color that I was mixing before. The purple was perfect for the shadows. That's why you see me continuing to mix a lot of purple, but I'm not doing a great job of preserving some of my whites, um, but I'm a cheater, a big old cheater, and I will probably come back in with a white gel pen or something like that afterwards and um, knock in a couple of the more crisp, tiny highlights after the fact because it's oh so satisfying to do that. One thing that sort of happened unintentionally is that I worked some shadows before the other areas. So here I am dropping in this uh, shadowy purple shape on the chair there and really that's just not it's not how I normally work in watercolor it's not how anybody would suggest you work in watercolor um, but because I really wasn't my mind wasn't on it I wasn't thinking too hard about any of this um, I did a really weird sort of backwards process half the time um, it would have served me a lot better to look for all my lights and work light to dark, mixing darker and darker as I went. Here I am preserving odd little shapes for my around the buttons in the chair. Um, I love these types of chairs that are actually really fun to draw, and it didn't turn out for me with this painting, but that's okay. It was still super fun. Working in this weird backwards way here finally I did the light red first and now I'm dropping in some darks and it blends out look at it bleed out so smoothly that's lovely I mixed a very light blue to sort of knock I don't know why I'm saying knock and sway so much um, those are not our terms <laughs> But I'm putting a tiny bit of pale blue in the highlights because that light, as I said, from the window is kind of cold. I just dropped my brush there. It didn't hit the painting. But that's something that happens to me. Does it happen to you where you're painting along and then your hand just decides to spaz on you? It just drops the brush with paint in it just boop, right onto your painting? Super fun when that happens. <laughs> so I'm working in some shadows here. And one part that I don't like so much about this painting sketch is um, what happens with the light and shadow on her dress makes her look, I don't know, lumpy. Um, her, her legs look, oh, just anatomically impossible um, based on just the way the highlighting happened, but that's okay. I don't know why I'm pulling, like drawing attention to the things that didn't go 
didn't go well here, but hope you enjoy that. Um, let's talk about things that did go well. I loved the book. I thought the book, the shadows on the book ended up really nicely. Um, I'm looking for other things I like. I kind of like the shadow on the arm that we see, her left, our, uh, the one that we see on the right. I kind of like the shadows on that arm. Um, maybe I like one of the legs, the, the leg that's further down. I am having trouble looking for things and finding things that I actually like in this sketch. Let's just say I liked the process. That was very relaxing. And I actually got pretty absorbed in it. You don't see me reaching for my wine very much in this, um, during this time. I'm just in the zone. When you're observing, your mind doesn't have a ton of space for other things. So, um, it's like a Zen experience. You're, you're focused on one thing. You're in the moment. That's why often I will do a voiceover after I've sat down and done a little painting session, because if I try to talk to you while I'm painting, um, it would have turned out probably even worse because you're using too much brain power. <laughs> Sometimes I'm quiet when I'm doing demos in class to my students. And then when I'm comfortable and I've done it a bunch, I can slow down and articulate what I am doing. But that's not always the case. I'm going to speed up my painting of the chair here. I basically uh, fiddled and fiddled and fiddled getting the right sort of burgundy color and then started sketching in the little creases around each button. Um, they kind of look like little spiders and little lines connecting the, the cushions. They kind of have to go in the same direction. So I kind of made diamonds between, I say cushions, between buttons. Um, and then willy nilly added some shading and it kind of, I don't know, didn't ruin the effect, but it uh, wasn't the result I was really hoping for. And it was a bit fiddly. I feel like I probably could have gone up a, a brush size for maybe not around the buttons, but the rest of it. Now I'm going to deepen some shadows and define the sketch a little more. So again, sketching with the paintbrush. So for this kind of stuff, I, I did need a four. I wouldn't have been able, I could have done it with a bigger brush, but it would have had to been around and I would have had to use the very tip just like this to, you can kind of use a, a range of brush sizes. If you are using a round and you're using the tip of it, you can get kind of details regardless of whether or not you're using a four, six, eight, um, but obviously the brushes hold a different amount of water and might give you less control the larger you go. But I have noticed with a lot of beginner watercolorists that they tend to use this tiny, tiny brush for detail and it, and it ends up looking kind of fiddly and forced. Um, and I'm, I would say, um, I'm guilty of that with today's sketch. I will make a concerted effort to use a larger brush in my next watercolor sketch as well as just a range of brushes instead of just kind of using one the whole time. Um, one of my favorite watercolorists, Liz Steele, I follow her and I learn from her because she's able to let go and be loose. I think that's takes so much skill to to try to be looser and let watercolor I think she calls it watercolor magic. You've got to let the watercolor be magical. Here I finally get a flat sort of wash brush because I was using the fiddly four for the ground there. You can see how much more I can cover. I'm not used to working on this paper. It's super absorbent. So um, that could be another reason that I felt a bit uncomfortable with today's sketch is that the paper does matter and the absorbency of it changes how you work so much. 
This is Synthetic Squirrel, I believe, from a, a set that I recently purchased. And brushes, I'll say, also do matter for watercolor more than, I feel like, say, acrylic uh, medium. Brushes with watercolor hold different amounts of water and they allow you to work so differently. So it's not a lie when someone says you might need to change your brushes for watercolor. Maybe not when you're just first beginning and learning, but if you feel you've reached a plateau, change your brushes and you'll open up a wide new range of ways to work and just change the way you can control what's going on. It is an investment though. Brushes can be so pricey. Look at how easy it is to drop in this wide shadow there with the, the bigger wash brush. It's not even a gigantic brush, but compared to the size of the paper I'm working on. Most of this whole drawing is quite warm. And then it looks like I just mixed a bit of green for the background. Um, I don't sketch these in properly. So again, as far as my sketches of books and shelves go, ouch, this is not the best, but I chose colder colors for the background, uh, cooler colors. Cooler colors are generally thought to be like purples, blues, and greens, and those recede on the picture plane. So when I'm choosing to use cooler hues in the background, it should have the effect of falling behind and looking like it's further back than the girl in her book because all of that is quite warm even though it's you know purpley it's a really warm red purple i'm going to fast forward my bookshelf sketchy um, part i did actually pull out the pencil to work on a little stack of books here um, and beyond that, you know, very, very, very little drafting before just going in with watercolor and plopping down some, some color. I'm doing the background here first before going around the books. I mean, before doing the books themselves. It's kind of like a light wood color. Oddly enough, I ended up leaving more white on the lower bookshelves where less light would hit it because of the chair. That's okay. Gives you finally going kind of in the right direction. I'm adding shadow after. A couple of light blue dashes on the window panes. Darkening the wood and leaving kind of a little bit of an edge or lip to it so it looks like the light's hitting part of the window, pane, uh, window frame. Adding a bit of that blue light to the book cover here. It's very, very subtle, but in the actual painting, if you were here in person, you could see that that little tiny bit of cerulean blue um, in the highlights helps create that warm versus cool play throughout this whole sketch. I'm kind of warming up the legs here with a bit of pink and the arms too. I'm doing the kind of the fat final touches before deciding whether or not I should work in pen over this. Often I work pen first and then paint and this time I'm thinking I'm actually considering adding pen after the fact. Might help sharpen up the sketch a little because it was very loose. Um, I think it might have a really nice effect, especially if maybe I don't use black pen this time. I think maybe using a colored pen, almost like I used a colored pencil crayon to draw at the at start might be nice and helpful. There she is. Her hands are kind of mucky there, but overall kind of fun. I think my favorite part about this sketch is the quality of light throughout it that bright light and shadow. I'm going to jump in here with a Le Pen in this purple color and just try to define some of the sketch. I'm not outlining everything. When you add pen it's not like okay it's time to outline. 
I'm just looking for edges that were lost or things that need a bit more definition, the edges of the fingertips there. Tried to add some to the hair, but it didn't really show up over the dark brown. Um, the legs definitely needed some defining, so they look less like just a Play-Doh blob. And it is kind of fun to outline some of the shadow shapes too and just get some fine line in there. This is not very intrusive like a black pen would be, so that that's kind of fun. Um, I did take a pause here to pick up my brush again and add some shadow shapes in paint. That'll happen when you flip back and forth, you work with pen a little bit and then you're like, oh, I need to fix this or add this. I'm very glad I did. Um, it wouldn't be the same if I, you know, cross hatched that in with the pen for shadow. It's nice that I was able to go back and drop in some more color on the floor here. And then jump right back into work with the pen. There's my wine done. And I don't really have much more to say other than I just kind of flip a little bit between these two purples, um, defining the buttons here and laying in some of the creases of the leather chair. If you haven't drawn one of these chairs before, uh, go do that now. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I love drawing the little creases and highlights on leather. It's shiny surface, so you get um, a different, you get some highlights and it's not like doing wrinkles of fabric. Outlining the shelves here a little bit. And next I just draw in some of the books. I really like the little book stack um, on the second to top shelf, the one I'm doing right now. I love drawing books. <laughs> I love reading books. I love everything about books. Books, books, books. This brings the sketchy part to a close. And let's take a little bit of a closer swipe past. See what I mean about the lumpy belly? Oh well. I think now we could probably go in and add a few highlights. My cheater cheater marker highlights. I start in with a Uniball Signo broad sized and it doesn't work very well so I give up and I pull out my jelly roll and I think a size 10 might have been an 8 um, and that doesn't work very well either and I get all grumpy <laughs> so I pull out I try this one more time and then I pull out a different uh, jelly roll you just gotta sometimes try back and forth till you find one that happens to be working for you that day I mean I know this is this paper is really bumpy so that could be it, and it's not very smooth. I wonder if I can get the correct shape of the leg back through a little clever use of gel pen. Definitely accidentally went over a lot of these whites with my paintbrush and didn't get to preserve them, so it's kind of nice that I'm able to go back now and fix up a bit of that. It doesn't look like much, but the little details like Getting the side of the hand or that little triangle below the wrist enforces the correct anatomy, reinforces the right anatomy, and overall, winner, winner, chicken dinner. So these are the whites I initially tried to preserve and then lost, and so I'm able now, I already defined where they go, I'm able now to just go back in and fix them up. A bigger white marker would be better for this top here. So this is the Jane Davenport Storytime paint pen in white. Snow white, to be more specific. Just covers a lot more area. It's a bit more opaque than the gel pen, so I can cover up more mistakes.
get some highlights in the bookshelf here. Gotta be careful not to let out a ton of paint here. Should have a scrap piece. I'm pushing down on the nib to get more white paint out, but I don't want a big giant puddle, which these markers tend to do. Not just Jane Davenport, all paint pens do that. So be careful and activate them on a scrap page. I don't think there's much more correcting I can do. I think I've gone as far as I can with this. Nothing else is glaring to me that can actually be altered with a paint pen. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed that. I, I know I did. I need it. It's my therapy to just have some time to slow down, practice observing because that makes you fully present if you're in um, observation mode in drawing or in painting. And to just take some time for you. There doesn't have to be a purpose, right? Nobody sees our sketchbooks. I mean, you see my sketchbooks, but that's not why I sketch. And that's not why I kept sketchbooks for 20 years before I ever thought I would ever have a YouTube channel. Sketching is for us. Well, that's all I have for you today. I'll see you next week for another art video. Bye.